Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. at Stanford, and he's been working on a subject of great interest to us, obviously, which is uh, transactions. And um, uh, Christos is going to be visiting us this afternoon, I think, uh, talking to many of us. So, Christos. Thanks, Jim. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. As I was telling Jim a minute ago, my parents are visiting from Greece these days. They arrived on, Saturday, on Sunday. I had to explain to them they were going to disappear for a couple of days. Uh, so I told them I'm giving a talk at Microsoft, and my mother said, you must be doing something important now, uh, <laughs> since I'm here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the TCC project, which stands for Transactional Coherence and Consistency. And this is actually a joint project with my colleague, uh, Kunle Lukutun at Stanford. Uh, Kunle really wanted to be here today, but it turns out that he has to be in Jamaica for vacation, so uh, priorities. Uh, okay. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I come from the hardware point of view. So I'm a hardware designer, processor designer, and I'm trying to figure out what's the next cool thing to do with, with architecture. So if you take a look at what's been happening with architecture the last 20 years, we've basically been improving uniprocessor systems. And it's been great, 55% per year. It has enabled a wide range of improvements in the software side and with services. However, we've been running down to some bottlenecks which are fairly fundamental. So we've reached the point that scaling a uniprocessor system uh, no longer does it. So basically we've run into wire delays, memory latency, power consumption. It takes a large number of millions of dollars to design and verify one of the systems. And in general, it seems like we've also reached the fundamental limit of the type of parallelism that this processor exploit, instruction level parallelism. So everybody these days is basically saying, let's switch to single chip multiprocessors. And the basic idea there is that instead of trying to exploit instruction level parallelism, go for some more scalable form of parallelism, data level parallelism or task level parallelism. And it turns out that these types of parallelism, if they exist, they scale with the application. So the next image format will have more pixels than the current ones, or more data level parallelism. Google will hopefully get more queries next year, so more task level parallelism, this kind of stuff. Now, single chip multiprocessors work really well with modern VLSI technology, and the most important thing is that they have a clear scaling path. Okay? So you have two processors uh, this year, four next year, eight the year after that, and so on. And it also turns out that apart from performance, you can also get uh, good fault tolerance. If you have eight of these processors and one of them fails, you're going to lose some performance, but you can still live with it. So single chip multiprocessors, uh, it was a great topic of research uh, about, uh, for the last 10 years, and now everybody is doing it in the sense that every single vendor out there has been announcing multiprocessor systems. Uh, Intel, ARM, AMD, uh, IBM, everybody. They either have already produced one of those or they're just about to ship one of those. And they want to use them for everything, embedded server, desktop, it's all going to be multiprocessors. So it sounds like great, it's all been done. So, so what's the question there? So why do architects care about something that all the companies have already announced? We should be doing the next thing. Well, it turns out that the big problem that we have is the software. We have absolutely no idea what to run on these multiprocessor systems. So if you think wha about what's happening with the software, millions of people know how to write a sequential program. Okay? It's a combination of the uh, programs that we have been, uh, made with languages and the fact that compilers are pretty good. So uh, many people can basically write a program in C++, Java, you know, their favorite language, and some compiler would generate an efficient executable. And we've also spent the last few decades training these people to think about this way, and they've got pretty good at it. On the other hand, when it comes to parallel programs, the situation is very, very different. There's an extremely small number of people who can write correct parallel programs. And that's the case even in a computer science department like uh, the one at Stanford. And there is an even smaller number of people who can actually write an efficient parallel program, one that's correct and gives you the performance characteristics that you expect in the first place. Sometimes I can write a correct program, but I rarely can write an efficient program, and I'm supposed to be an expert on parallel systems. Oh, well. So at the end of the day, the big problem that we're having is parallel software. And this is the problem that we have to solve now. Okay. If we want to get the performance benefits of parallel systems, we have to provide parallel software. And there is no safety net. We cannot keep pushing uh, single-thread performance from the point of view of programming because the hardware that cannot scale any longer.
And we cannot rely on just parallelizing compilers becoming the commonplace, because it turns out that with, even though uh, we have all these years of research on this topic, they do work only for a limited number of cases, dense algebraic computations. Compilers can help a lot, transform one from parallelism to another, optimize, and so on, but the idea of writing a sequential C++ application and having a super smart compiler parallelize across eight processors doesn't seem to be something we can bet on at least for the next few years. So why is parallel programming difficult? You know, people started writing parallel programs uh, as soon as they had the first parallel computer, which was right after they built the first sequential computer. So it's a 40-year-old uh, area. What's the difficulty with it? Well, there are two ways to write parallel programs. One way is to go with shared memory threads, in which case the programmer has to control synchronization using something like logs or mutexes or, or barriers. Now, here are the problems. The first one is that you have this fundamental trade-off between performance and correctness. You're either going to do coarse screen locking, which is really easy to control as a programmer, but you will likely get bad performance because you're stalling too much. Uh, you're synchronizing it without any good reason. Or you're going to try to do fine grain locking, which has a potential for really good performance, but now it becomes difficult to manage. It's very easy to forget the lock here, to associate the, lock, the, the, the wrong lock uh, with a uh, set of data. I basically end up with uh, races or deadlocks. Okay. And it's really, really tough to find what's the right trade-off between performance and correctness for every application. The second thing has to do with performance tuning. Suppose that you have one correct parallel program, and now what you want to do is take it from some poor performance to the almost linear speed that you expect from a parallel system. It turns out that there's an abstraction gap there. If you try to understand why your program is performing poorly, you are going to end up looking at things like false sharing, coherence misses, and stuff like that which make perfect sense for an architect, but they make absolutely no sense to the average programmer. It basically requires you to be an architect to be able to understand why your program performs poorly. Okay. And then finally, there is this uh, issue about uh, faults. When you have shared memory threads, there's absolutely no isolation when you have faults, whether they're hardware faults, software faults, uh, or any other kind of fault. The moment one of the threads creates a problem, it can quickly propagate through the shared memory to all the other threads. And this turns out to be a big issue if you have uh, something like an operating system or a middleware uh, service. I forgot to mention that feel free to interrupt me at any point in time and ask questions. Uh, I, I really enjoy questions. This is a relatively young project, about one year old. Uh, we probably have more questions than answers. And any tough questions are really motivation for me to look into uh, some things in more detail. So uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt me. The second way to write parallel programs is to use a message passing system, where the programmer basically manually uh, controls synchronization communication by communicating messages back and forth. And it turns out that this model is pretty much similar to the shared uh, memory model, even though it seems to be fundamentally different uh, at first place. So the problem that you have there is that it's difficult to produce the first correct code. Because in order to produce the first correct code for your program, you have to understand every single point where you may communicate or you may synchronize. And you have to do a message there. Now, if you miss one case, you're going to end up with an incorrect result, a deadlock, all sorts of things. So putting the messages there is not that much different from putting the, uh, the locks there. And of course, this is difficult for irregular applications or applications with adaptive patterns. If every application was just like matrix multiply, the world would be a better place, but it turns out that they're not. And then once again, you do have a correctness performance trade-off. From uh, the point of view of simplicity, you want to communicate late. Right at the point where you want to communicate, you send the message. That makes it really easy to be able to tell where you need to communicate, uh, what to send, and where to send it. On the other hand, if you want to hide latency, you want to do the communication early. But the earlier you try to push the communication, the more difficult it is to figure out where you need to send data and what data you need to send to another processor. So it ends up being quite uh, difficult as well. My experience has always been that shared memory makes it a little bit easier to get the first version right, but performance tuning is uh, extremely difficult. With message passing, it's the other way around. If your goal is to write an efficient program at the end of the day, you're going to see you know, pretty much the same difficulty. So basically, communicating late, it means basically communicate right at the point where the data is necessary on the other side. Okay. So at that point in time, it's really easy to look at your problem and say, yeah, I need exactly that data. 
uh, from that processor, I'm going to do the sends and receives and I get it over with. But you won't hide the latency. You typically want to hide the communication overhead behind some computation. So some amount of time before you actually need the data, you want to send the data. But now that means that you need to know exactly what needs to be sent and where earlier in your program. And the more complicated your program is, the more difficult it is to tell, you know, in a couple of seconds I will need that data there or something like that. So what are we trying to do with the TCC project? Basically what we're trying to do is provide a shared memory model for parallelism, which is hopefully easy to program, provides good performance with some relatively simple hardware, and has some interesting fault isolation characteristics. And at the end of the day, what we really want to do is make parallel programming practical for the average developer. As opposed to be something that only some experts can do, let's come up with a way that parallel programming um, is a straightforward thing for every single employer of an ISV out there. And hopefully once we get everybody writing parallel programs, then we can go back to architecture where we come from and do all the cool things, get nice performance, uh, speed ups and so on, and uh, be happy about this. So this project to some extent for us is a big detour through software to be able to do hardware. Now what's interesting about uh, our work, basically we're trying to use abstractions as the only uh, transactions as the only abstraction for anything you want to do in a parallel program. So a transaction is the only thing we will give you to express parallel work, communication, coherence and consistency, failure atomicity, it's going to be your unit for performance optimization. There is nothing else in our system. There's no threads, no logs. All we give you is transactions. So basically your program is just a co big collection of transactions. Anything that you want to execute at any point in time, it has to be in a transaction. So transactions are no longer just a synchronization mechanism. It's a mechanism for everything. Okay? And I can see that you don't have locks, but I don't see where you don't have threads. Well, we have collections of transactions. So within, we can create groups of transactions with different order and semantics, but we don't call them threads. We call them collections of transactions. No, yeah. it's, it's close enough. The main thing to take away is that you can never execute non-transactional code. So you don't switch between transactional on and transactional off. Transactions are always on. Okay. But you do make a distinction between sequential composition and parallel composition? Can I specify? You can specify the order. I'm going to get to that. You, you, can, you can specify the order of transactions if you want. Okay. okay. Now, why are we looking at transactions? Okay. Uh, there are two reasons for that. The one is that if you look at uh, all this literature about uh, uh, parallel and distributed uh, programming, there are three major concepts for, pa for handling parallelism. There's shared memory of one kind or another, message passing of one kind or another, and then there are transactions. And unfortunately, there's no fourth fundamental uh, model around for us to try, so we kind of have to. Transactions have be very successful with, with the database community. They can be very successful with the persistent storage community, so it's worth trying to see what they can do for parallel programming. Now, here's a list of what we found difficult uh, when we try to parallelize a few applications, and here are some reasons why transactions can help us with a few of these things. So first of all, it's really difficult to parallelize an irregular application, where you're not really sure where the parallelism is, whether two tasks are really parallel or not. The nice thing about transactions is that they allow us to do unproven speculative parallelism. So we can assume that two things are uh, uh, parallel, execute them in parallel, and then towards the end, when the first one commits, figure out whether parallelism was truly there, if it was, great, we've done the right thing. If it wasn't the case, we roll back one of the two and re-execute. Okay, this is H.T. Kung's optimistic concurrency done for parallel programming, basically. The second thing is the difficulty of figuring out where to do synchronization with logs. And transactions essentially provide a coarse grain mechanism for doing atomicity over multiple objects. And the nice thing is that you no longer have to figure out which logs goes with which object. Okay. If you execute something with the transaction, you get the atomicity there. The third problem is the difficulty of reasoning about the consistency model. And this is both a hardware problem and a software problem. It's a big pain to figure out whether you implement the consistency model correctly in software. And it's a big pain to figure out how to reason about the consistency model in, uh, in the software. And anybody who has tried to look at the Java consistency model probably knows about this issue. The nice thing about transactions is that they basically allow you to reason about uh, consistency at the transaction level. And that, hopefully, it's coarse and grain. So instead of reasoning about the ordering of individual loads and stores, you reason about the order of some bigger chunk, which hopefully it's easier both for the programmer 
uh, and the compiler writer to reason about. Perhaps you address this question later, but let me ask it anyway. Supposing you have in one thread a transaction, A1 followed by a transaction A2, sequential composition, and a thread, uh, second thread, a transaction B1 followed by B2, do you uh, have sequential consistency over transaction in your system? So, uh, the transactions are always serializable. Okay, so whatever order you decide to commit them, it's going to be the same for the whole system. If you have specified for two transactions to be order, they're going to commit in order. All will seem to commit in order. Otherwise, you're just going to get to miss it. But whatever order you decide for the commit is going to be the same across the system. Uh, so transaction this inherent uh, support for uh, fault atomicity and recovery. You figure out an error, you get rid of your speculative state, and you re-execute. And then, as I'll show you in a second, uh, well, in uh, quite a few slides, actually, uh, it's also easy to tune transactional parallel programs. The problems that can come up with respect to performance during a transactional program are easy to identify, and it's also easy to identify the optimizations you need to implement to work around the bottlenecks. And then the question is why people haven't done transactions in the past. For the most part, because using transactions has been slow. And the way that we work around this thing is by throwing hardware to the problem. Okay? We use the big number of transistors available to us right now to make sure that transactions are uh, a cost-effective mechanism to use. Question. In execution, your transaction forms some kind of partially ordered set. Mm -hmm. Can you say? Anything about this partial set of transactions? So, well, you know, the, 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 the important thing is there as they commit in, well, let's suppose that they're fully unordered, uh, which is the simplest case first. There's no order whatsoever. What we do right now, we commit them first come, first serve. As they finish, we commit them. But we make sure that they're serializable. If one processor determines an order, this is the same order that every other processor seems to follow. Okay? And we do the same thing with partial orders. Uh, if two transactions are not ordered with respect to each other, the same commit order will be visible across the whole system, and it's going to be whichever of the two, A before B or B before A. But you will execute them one after another? Not, no, no, we execute, so as, as I'll show you in a second, we speculatively execute things in parallel, but then we have to commit them either in a specific order or at least in a serializable order. Okay. So we do optimistic concurrency all over the place just to figure out how to get some parallelism out of this thing. So it could be the case that your program is truly parallel, but you as the programmer don't know about it. So for example, suppose that you have a histogram computation. This is a highly parallel uh, task where order doesn't matter, as long as you get atomicity. Um, you could specify this order transactions. We'll execute them in parallel. Okay, we'll just be a little bit more constrained in the way that you commit them. As opposed to commit them in any order that they finish, We'll make sure that we commit them in order. Committing in order doesn't necessarily mean that they commit one after the other. It means that from the point of view of a single memory location, the first transaction will always get to write before the second transaction gets to write. <coughs> so commits can go in parallel as long as the result is as if they go uh, in order. So here's a quick outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, the mechanism behind ECC. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about a study that we did to basically evaluate what's the performance potential of this model and what are the requirements from the point of view of the hardware. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a simple architecture for implementing transactional coherence and consistency in chip multiprocessors. And I'm going to tell you how it compares to uh, a more straightforward uh, CMP with conventional shared memory. And then I'm going to tell you a few things about where we're going with this project. So first of all, what do we mean with transactions? And this is an overloaded term, and different people they mean different things. I think uh, Jim once uh, proposed to me to rename it to something else to make it clearer. Uh, so far, we haven't been able to find a good enough name. I think transactions are pretty sexy as a name these days, so we want to keep it. But if you have another suggestion, you know, feel free. We have the same problem. <laughs> uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it, it's a topic that, uh, you know, with the moment we mention transaction, many people uh, want to listen to you. So. We don't want to lose that, uh, that effect. OK, so what do you mean by transactions? This is basically a sequence of instructions uh, which commit or abort atomically. And within the sequence of instructions, you can have loops, function calls, whatever you want. Okay. Now, basically, what we do with these transactions, we expose them all the way to the programmer. So we expect the programmer to write a program by basically having a number of transactions. 
Okay. Now, the fact that the programmer knows about the transactions doesn't mean that it w they won't be op automatically optimized by a static dynamic compiler. So the programmer may write a set of transactions, and then the compiler may decide to merge, split, reorder, whatever compilers want to do to optimize the program. Now, from the point of view of uh, ordering, here's what we do. Typically, uh, in, in most uh, of the React literature, we have unordered transactions. So we just guarantee atomicity. In our case, we also allow for transactions to be fully ordered or partially ordered. Okay. And once again, this doesn't mean that they will execute sequentially or they could meet that, that they will commit one after the other. It just means that from the point of view of a single memory location, they seem to commit in one order or in a partial order and so on. So overall, what we do is similar to the database concept. We provide for atomistic consistency and isolation. We don't do durability. If you want that, it will cost you two AA batteries or a car battery, depending on the size of the system. Basically, what we do is lightweight transactions, which are directly supported by the hardware. Okay? And it's the hardware that's responsible for providing the serializability. I don't understand the memory model. Should it be obvious? Uh, the consistent model, basically? Yeah. I mean, if there's some memory out there. There's a bunch of processors. When I execute these instructions, so basically how do they what happens, interact with other ones? Well, that's a really good point. So what happens when you execute instructions? So basically, here's the execution model of, of uh, our system. Well, we optimistically execute transactions in parallel. So we put, pull out from the pre program the transactions. We assume that they are parallel, and we execute them while buffering all the read and write state. So every processor is basically reading and writing data and never exposes all these reads and writes to any other processor until it reaches a commit point for the transaction. So from the point of view of shared memory, essentially you have coherence, consistency, and communication only at the point that the transaction reaches a commit. And until that point, any reads or writes from, from each transaction, they're not visible to anybody else. Can one imagine that uh, uh, until commitment, every processor has, has his own copy of memory? No. no. Uh, essentially, it does. It, 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 it buffers locally. And we're going to get into the complication of that. But at, at this point here, CPU 0 will send its read and write state, depending on how you implement it, to other processors. So other processors pick halfway through a transaction, they may pick into the state committed by uh, another, trans another processor. However, each processor will not send anything out until it reaches a commit point. Okay. So let me go over the steps here just to make it a little bit clearer. So we execute speculatively. We buffer everything locally. Uh, and let's assume that right now you can buffer infinitely. Uh, at some point, we're going to reach the end of the transaction and go through an arbitration phase, okay, which is the next transaction allowed to commit. Uh, and this is basically where we may take into account the user-specified order. If the user-specified fully ordered transactions or partially ordered transactions, we have to take, take it into account. If we have just unordered transactions, it's first come, first served, or something close enough to that. And then we reach the commit point. Now, the commit point means that basically each transaction gets to broadcast its right state to the rest of the system. And that serves two purposes. First of all, you update the permanent state of the machine, okay, the main memory, uh, what other transactions will get to read uh, to get the values of this data. And you also notify other pending transactions about which variables were updated in order to detect any dependency violations. So if any other transaction starts executing too early, okay, read an old value of the data which are committed by the currently committed transaction and operate on that, we can detect it by basically uh, taking a look at the rights of the commit transaction, uh, find the dependency violation, and restart the offending transaction. So the committing transaction sends out the state and it's golden. Some other transactions may decide to uh, uh, violate based on that. Just one second. Even when you don't have uh, a violation, other transactions or other processors will take a look at this right state being committed and potentially update or invalidate any local copies of data that they keep in their caches. Okay. Any question there? So you speak about a commit of a particular transaction. Mm -hmm. So CPU zero may be busy with committing transaction number zero, mm -hmm. while CPU one may be busy with with committing to trans another transaction. Right? Uh, so right now in the simple system that we'll show you in a second, we really do one commit at a time. 
We don't overlap commits at all. You can overlap commits. You can do a two-phase commit protocol or actually something similar than that to be able to overlap commit. However, you need to make sure that uh, the two commit, if you do the commits in parallel, they don't interact uh, 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 with each other in an inconsistent state, right? If you do two transactions in parallel, then different process source can be busy with different transactions. Right. So right now what we do is we execute, in, so in the simple system I will show later on, we execute as many of those as you want in parallel, and we really commit one at a time. So while the, actually this is what I'm showing in the slide, which is good. So while CPU0 is committing a transaction, CPU1, even though it's done with its own code, it's just sitting and waiting. Okay, so in this slide, I'm actually showing one commit at a time and no overlap between the commits. Okay, now during this commit time, for example, CPU2 is still executing some code, and that's fine. But in the simplest system, which it turns out to be good enough for a single chip, uh, one commit at a time uh, will do the trick. If you want to do multiple commits in parallel, which if you scale the system enough, you will have to. Uh, you have to do a two-phase commit protocol, which is obviously more complicated than one commit at a time. It feels to me like we've confused the implementation of this thing with the contract and abstraction that's presented to a programmer. I'd, okay. I'd like to see what the programmer's contract is and then dig into that. Right, so, so the programmer works. Con contract is... Uh, Without being a PL person, so I'm not put in the best terms, is basically your program is consists of transactions, nothing else. Okay, every, well, everything has to be in transactions. Communication, coherence, and consistency is only maintained at the transaction boundaries. And you can think about these transactions commit one at a time. That's the semantics that the execution model supports. It's a lot buried in commit there, but uh, can, I, can I make an attempt? Sure. So the programming model is the following. The programmer specifies a partially ordered list of transactions. Yes. And that partially ordered list of transactions gets executed uh, in a serial manner. That serial uh, order respects the partial order. And every chunk gets executed one at a time. So there's this unified view of memory. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm coming around to is if the partial order specification is inadequate, then it seems like it's kind of ah. wrong results. Well, so, it's, so it's going to predict one of a bunch of non yes. results. Something that's that's right. so, not expected. Yes. Okay. So, so that's a good point. This was easy and no, no. That, so, that sounds kind of tricky. So that's a good point. So what's what's the main weakness from the point of view of writing a program with this thing? What if what used to be a critical region in your program, you break into transactions, and if you do that, bad things will happen in your program. You get races and so on. Yeah. Uh, and. I cannot give you a number how often this can happen and so on. We haven't reached a point of doing extension studies. The reason that I think it's going to be easier than doing it with logs is because, first of all, you don't have to associate, uh, you don't have to worry about the match between logs and, uh, and yeah. the data. And you can do it at the course of granularity. So it can still happen. You can still break down your program to non atomic regions, uh, but hopefully this makes it easier to avoid it. So. Oh, yes, I'm not showing a violation here. So here's what could happen. As CPU 0 commits, let's say it wrote variable A, which CPU 1 read, okay, and it realized that when it gets uh, uh, this broadcast message, uh, and then it decides to re-execute, start from the scratch. Hopefully the next time it executes, it reads the correct value uh, from uh, CPU 0 and so on. Uh, and I'm not showing this in this figure. The whole assumption here, of course, is that you start with parallel computations where dependencies are the infrequent case, right? If you have a program which has very fine grain communication patterns, this thing will break down. The good or bad news, depending on which way you want to see it, almost every other parallel model that I know of will break down in this case. Okay. Uh, so, for better or worse, <laughs> we're... In, in other words, I'm glad you're not trying to solve the whole problem. Yeah. I mean, if you try to solve everything, you'll probably not make any progress. Isn't this similar to the Thomas Sulis algorithm with speculative execution? Well, to some extent, you can think about you know what an out-of-order processor does. Every instruction is a transaction. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can think about it this way. Yeah, I think it's that thing implemented. That there, there is a large amount of related work. I, I think you know the closest model conceptually is you know H. D. Kung's optimistic concurrency from early 80s. Uh, this is as close as it gets. Like we're doing this in hardware, essentially. 
Uh, there are many people who are doing transaction, uh, transactions for one thing or another. The most common approach is to replace locks with transactions. And we're going the full nine yards, just using them all over the place. There's a huge amount of, of, of related work, you're right. OK, so how do we expect people to write transactional programs? And uh, we published the first set of results at Task 2004 this year. So it's a process with three steps. The first thing that you need to do is identify potentially parallel work and cast it as transactions. The good news here are that you don't have to prove that things are independent. Okay, so speculative parallelism works fine. Uh, and we basically provide two constructs to write transactions right now. One is transactions through loops, and one is transactions through forking a function, which is similar to forking a thread. And I'm going to get into some details of those later on. The second thing that you have to do is specify the commit order. And this is exactly where you can get into trouble if you specify the wrong order if you, or if you chop transactions the wrong way. Uh, we support three things. The one is fully ordered transactions. And this is basically, for example, what you uh, want to get. If you have a loop which it may be parallel, but to be safe, you want to get the sequential smart just, just in case. We support unordered transactions. Uh, where basically they all execute in parallel and they commit in whatever order they're finished. It's a dual loop uh, for those of you with a photon background. And then we also support partial orders. So within one group, we may have order, and across groups, we have just atomicity. And one example of a program that we've been trying to apply <coughs> this partial order is the following. Suppose that you want to do in software a net network router. If you have, uh, and every packet basically that you get from uh, the input, uh, uh, input cards is a transaction. Is a transaction. Every time that you have packets from uh, the same flow, you may want to maintain order if, of course, the network protocol requires for order. So you want to make sure that you output these packets, the result of these packets, in order. While across different flows, there's no relation between packets. All you want to be sure of is that when it comes to accessing common data structures, the routing table, the output buffer, you get automicity. Okay. Yes, sir. How do you get to specify this partial order? Are you going to tell us? Okay, yeah, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to quickly highlight, but you're probably going to need more details. You're going to ask me this again. Uh, uh, and then the third step is to basically do uh, feedback based optimizations. And I'm going to go more into this uh, uh, later on. Basically, it turns out that during the transactional execution, you pretty much track everything that can go wrong with transactions. You have to. And if you expose this to the programmer or to a dynamic compiler, then you can go back and fix your progress and hopefully get the best performance you can get within this model. Now, why do we think this is easier? Uh, it still has a few issues, as, as you brought up, but I believe that getting rid of the logs uh, uh, helps a lot. You don't have to worry about associating the right log with the right data. The granularity becomes coarser. <coughs> Speculative parallelism helps us a lot with irregular applications. Uh, the consistency model, you know, being much coarse and grain from individual auto stores to larger chunks, uh, it's also a big win. Um, for the program that we've looked so far, transactions can be anything from a few thousand instructions to half a million instructions, which is a much coarse and grain uh, chunk rather than individual auto stores. Failure atomicity is there. Uh, we haven't really done too much with it, but there's no fundamental reason. Uh, why you shouldn't be able to do this. And then I'll try to convince you about performance tuning later on. OK, so right now we have a primitive API for specifying transactions in uh, C and Java programs. Uh, this is not necessarily what we want to be the end product of this group, but it's been enough to play with applications so far. Uh, so uh, your whole application is a transaction. You can just take the sequential uh, application just do commit points, and those basically break the program down to transactions. But we have a couple of high level uh, concerts just to make it a little bit easier. There's a transactional uh, for loop, which basically allows you to generate transactions from iterations. Um, for the most part, it generates one transaction per iteration, and they're all ordered. But uh, as additional features, options, you can specify whether you want multiple transactions per iteration to amortize the overhead, or whether you want unordered transactions. So this takes you from fully ordered to unordered. Okay, that's the only switch between orders that you can do there. Um, the fork mechanism is just like a fork, a fork in a thread. And in this case, basically, you take a function and you execute it as a transaction. Now, there you actually have the control, full control of ordering. So whenever you uh, 
fork a new transaction, you get to specify two things. One is what is the group of transactions it belongs to, and then what's the order within the group. And the order is an increasing number. So you actually specify the increment on the order as opposed to the order. Within each group, we follow whatever order you specify. So if the old order was five or the new order uh, is six, you've got two transactions that are fully ordered. If the order is the same, it means that they are in order. Across groups, you only support automicity. Okay, and they are basically uh, arguments to the four call to specify the order. Now, it's really important to, to specify the order in increments and not in absolute numbers, because going back in the order is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, uh, the commit call which we have there, just in case you want to break up your sequential code, and then we've been playing a little bit with scheduling constructs, and we're not that confident about what's the right thing yet. So right now, in the simplest case, we just execute speculative transactions all the time. Sometimes it's a bad idea. You know that a certain transaction will need to use data from another transaction, so you might as well wait for it to end. Uh, we're still looking into what's the right way to do this in the program, whether you just push the whole problem into the runtime system. Uh, it's too early to be able to tell you what's the right thing there. Uh, two quick notes. Uh, for now, we only support flat transactions. You can nest your transactions any way you want, but basically what happens is the outer transaction subsumes the inner one. Uh, this is something that it's been good enough for us up to now, and if we run into a case where we need to do something smarter, we look into this. But uh, so far, we haven't. So you can nest them any way you want. Just from the execution point of view, you always roll back to the outer transaction. OK, this is what we do right now. So I find that a little confusing. So for example, the T4 loop, what, does it mean that the, the currently running transaction, when you hit the for loop, does it have to commit before you start the for loop? Actually, both of these points, uh, both of these constructs, when you reach them in your program, it's just like having a commit, and then you start a bunch of other transactions, yes. That's both for the for and the fork. Oh, that one function that has a for loop, and outside it, it says, oh, I want this big transaction here. Because you're now mm -hmm. breaking the transaction. Into I'm not sure I understand the, the question. So, so oh, you can. You're basically specifying not transactions, but commit points, right? Essentially, yes. If you want your, fo your whole for loop to execute within one transaction, just use the regular for. Right, but maybe this is in some, in some library, right? That I have yes. So, so as I told you, up to now, we haven't run any programs with significant code in libraries. So flattening the hierarchy has been good enough. Uh, this is not necessarily what we'll be doing forever. I don't know. Uh, that's the only answer to that. So, to, just to follow up on that point, the, the model you showed a couple slides ago, you've got explicit begin end transaction instructions. This model, I'm not seeing begin transaction anywhere. Uh, actually, all I'm seeing is commit points. Uh, it's essentially the same. So, a commit point, because we are continuously a transaction, whenever you end a transaction, you immediately start the next one. There's nothing which is not transaction now. Okay? You cannot be outside of a transaction. The moment you, you finish a transaction, the only thing you can do is start another one. Basically, the, the T4 and T4 can allow you to basically specify transactions outside the single thread of control. Okay? But if you just think about straight line code, nothing else, you just put commit points. There's nothing else. Your commit point is end and begin together bundle. It's very hard to, to lift this model to a nested transaction model. In fact, I would go so far. I, I don't see how you can write a nested transaction using the syntax. So it can't. Actually. Oh, you cannot. No, it cannot. Um, you can do as much nesting as you want with a fork. We've done it. We just don't execute them as truly nested transaction as you expect from the database community. No, but if you, as soon as you write a fork, right, that ends the previous transaction. Uh, That's okay, a semantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can write a nested transaction. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, the fact that, that there's a you know, dependence between this comment and this note here, you're right, you're right. Yes. If, if we have to, to support nested, you know, truly nested transaction, we have to yeah. eliminate uh, the commit yeah. point from there's this. There's got to be some semantics that allows you to start something without stopping the current one. And it seems like all right, right, right. Model, you're right, you're right, you're right. Which is you're a, right, you're falls right. out of the continuous thing, right? right. Yeah. But once again, the reason to do this right now is because it's the simplest thing you can do, and so far it worked. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is not a promise for the Also, future. another quick question. I didn't understand how you specify the ordering between the transactions per iteration. So uh, when, there, when there, you are, 
you know, there are just, you know, there's a one flavor which basically says T4 order and one which says T4 unordered. It's as simple oh, as that. Oh, I see. Uh, so it's a very binary uh, decision here. Okay. While with the, the fork, you can specify whatever you want, uh, which also makes it trickier to use. How does, how does T make I don't want to get into this because this is basically the one. <laughs> so this is supposed to be a scheduling course where you basically, here's what we've done so far, and we, we're not happy with it. That's why uh, I don't want to get into details. So far, what the T-Way does, it allows you to say, I want to wait for this other transaction. Um, sometimes we want to wait about some event, some data, and we haven't gone that far. That, that, that's the only thing. So all our programs right now, they keep executing speculation. And the only thing that you're doing is you're wasting your time in the CPU. You execute the transaction much, much earlier than it should execute. OK? Uh, so as you will see, the applications that we've evaluated so far are so simplistic that scheduling is not a big deal. OK? So we're going to get into that soon. Uh, and then I'll be able to I tell could, you more. I could wait in the middle of the transaction. Uh, no, actually, this uh, wait statement basically tells you, I don't want to start unless this other thing is finished. Uh, we don't have any, right now, we don't have any wait for waiting in the middle of the transaction. You just go through, you realize that you had a dependency violation, and then you re-execute, which obviously can be a wasteful thing to do if you have a huge transaction. So far, we have not run into that problem. So how does this model that sort of mesh with uh, exceptions and error handling? Well. Uh, so basically, right now, the, the, you can do, you can think about error handling as another source of violation. The only difference is that what you do to handle this. <laughs> Instead of re-executing immediately, you may run some, some other code and then retry, right. or you may decide to abort altogether. Right. Do you have so, any support for that? Uh, right now, in this you know, simple I'm API, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. The right thing to do is something like the extend the try catch mechanism one way or another. You want to have some application level way of specifying a failure or a violation. Uh, which is, in my opinion, a very straightforward thing, but we haven't done it so far. I've done it. Okay. okay. So uh, the try-catch mechanism is as good as anything. Just need to redefine a few things a little bit. So here's a trivial example of how things work. You know, here's a histogram update. Instead of doing a for loop, you do a T for loop. You can specify grouping. Instead of doing one transaction, one of the respect transactions, you can do 20 of those uh, just to amortize the overhead. So from the execution point of view, it turns out to be you have a single transaction executing on its own uh, to do the input. Uh, then you have all these transactions that execute in parallel. They commit in order in this case. It's an order loop. And then you do the output. Actually, these seem like hard barriers in this figure. We actually speculate through, through those, but it makes it more difficult to draw the figure. Uh, so it's an extremely simple API just to allow us to get a little bit of experimentation there. Uh, <coughs> So, so having that 20 embedded in there, it seems like it, you're embedding information about the size of the hardware buffer in the code, right? No, this is, this, this is a good point. Um, this is uh, system dependent. What we're really talking about is overhead, the implementation overhead, which is more on the software side. How much time it takes you to, to fork a new uh, transaction yeah, right. and commit a transaction? Well, but you, you can't make it arbitrarily large because you know you do have limits to your exactly. So, so on the one hand, you want to make it large enough to to to. Uh, to amortize the overhead. On the other hand, you don't want to make too large to run into buffer overflows and violations. Right, okay. So yeah, right now, we're doing everything uh, at the program level. There's no runtime system to support anything right. smart or dynamic optimization environment. So starting with this very simple API, I decided okay, to, to see if that model of doing all transactions has any value from the point of view of performance, which was initial motivation. So basically, what we try to do is figure out what the speed that you can get on a CMP and what's the fundamental requirements, how much buffering you, you need, how much bandwidth you need, what's going on with arbitration latency, and so on. So we looked at the wide range of relatively simple applications, some of the Splash 2 programs, the Spec CPU, floating point programs. I think the most difficult thing we've tried so far is Spec JBB, which probably for many of you is a very simple application, but uh, it took us a while to get there. Um, and then we used a very simple API to get transactions from the program. For the most part, we're using ordered loops, but we use every single possible combination of, that you can get with a simple API. For this study here, we use trace-driven analysis. Uh, basically, we put the API um, uh, calls into the program. We run sequentially, got a trace of the loads and stores and the point where transactions uh, uh, start and end, 
And then we use a trace analyzer to be able to evaluate how these things would work if we execute transactions in parallel with CMP system. And the trace analyzer basically makes the very optimistic assumption that you have perfect caching in, a, uh, in, your, or in your CMP system. So other than transactions going wrong, nothing else can go wrong. So it gives us an evaluation of the potential of the performance, but it allows you to play with a few things such as the number of processors, the balance of the latest characteristics. I'm going to get to a more realistic evaluation later on. Question about the benchmarks. Do they contain any parallelism already in locking? And uh, those plus two benchmarks, the original version was multi-thread and had converted. Uh, for the others, I think we did everything by hand on our own. Uh, so lock, how did you deal with locking? That was in the oh, we had, so for example, for the case of the splash 2, uh, any point that you do a lock, it's a commit. Any point that you do an unlock, it's a commit. Any point that you have a buyer, is a commit. It was a very straightforward conversion. Uh, that worked for that benchmark. Yes. For the others, we basically took the sequential code and on our own, we say, well, that loops. That loop seems to be taking a significant amount of time. Let's do it with so research. For the other benchmarks, you just basically did parallelization. Yes, yeah, speculative parallelization. So, so I can see if you can see the, the lock and unlock in the same function, you, know, you understand that there's no commits in between. But if, there, if the lock is in one function and the unlock is in another, how do you know that there isn't a, an intermediate and interleaved commit that, that actually would break the semantics of the lock? Uh, so we, I don't think we. You have a single unit. You have an identity between the lock and unlock. Whereas here, you just have commit. I mean, it's. it's, a, it's a so this would definitely didn't show up in any of these programs that we worked on. Now, I, I think that it would still work though, because basically we don't. Well. Oh, I see your point. So you're basically saying if that thing has nesting, what you want to do, you want to do lock and unlock on the outer one and not in the inner one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that didn't come up with any of this program. Once again, we do this, everything manually right now, so there's no algorithm behind it. Uh, yeah. Uh, OK. So here's a quick and dirty evaluation of how much performance there is out there. So this is basically a, a snapshot of these applications. And this is basically what kind of speed up you can get as you scale the processor count from, four, from 1 to 32. And this is speed up relative to the case of one processor. So if you focus at the top of each bar for now, you see basically that you do get speed up. Okay? So having transaction all the time is not, is not a stupid idea. And actually, these speed ups look really close to what you could get with regular cash coherence. We're going to get to that in a second. Okay? So there is speed up there. We still have a number of, of um, optimistic assumptions like caches work perfectly. Could remove them in a second. The second, so uh, basically, you see some pro programs scale near perfectly, near linearly, uh, like Equake here. Some basically max out after a point. Now, what's going on there? First of all, there is a sequential portion of applications. Okay, we don't generate parallelism out of thin air. There is that much parallelism in applications. Uh, we just go after it. So at some point, it runs out. Uh, on large processor counts, certain applications run out of parallelism faster, and then we have violations and re-execution of transactions. This is definitely the case for spec JBB once you raise the number of processors a lot. And then in certain cases, you run out of bandwidth. Right now, we do very naive use of bandwidth. Whenever you finish the transaction, you just flash out all your write state and send it to the rest of the system, every, every other processor and the lower levels of the memory hierarchy. And it doesn't matter whether this data will ever be used by any other processor or their private data. It just flash out everything. So what you see here is each bar has three segments. The top part is what happens if you have an infinite amount of bandwidth. Okay, you can flash out as much data as you want. The second part is what happens if you have about 16 bytes per second of bandwidth within your system, okay, which is something reasonable to have in a chip multiprocessor. And the last segment of the uh, bar is what happens if you only have about four bytes per second, which is what you may have uh, in a uh, cost-effective uh, uh, multi-chip uh, multiprocessor. And then you see that there are several applications which are basically bandwidth sensitive. For example, Equake here, unless you provide more bandwidth than what you get with a simple implementation, there's no way to see speed up because you're spending way too much time waiting to flash out uh, the state uh, of a transaction at the commit point. On the other hand, certain other applications like spec JBB seem to be bandwidth sensitive, and that has to do with the fact that the, the ratio of number of instructions per byte written is, is quite high. Uh, the thing that I forgot to mention here is that for the case of the spec JBB, 
we try to parallelize within a single warehouse. Uh, often people parallelize across warehouses, which is relatively trivial. We try to parallelize within a single warehouse, which means basically that for the most part, every single application level transaction, book order, and so on, we cast it as a transaction in our case, and we get what we get. It's a fairly easy uh, thing to parallelize. If you want to do the same thing with logs, we we'll did fine grain logging, and it'll take much more time to get there. So there are certain things that can go wrong with this model. Uh, we assume that we can buffer locally uh, all the write and read state of a transaction while it executes, uh, so it doesn't get exposed to the rest of the system. So one obvious question is, you know, how much state do you really need? Here's the amount of write state that uh, some of these applications produce. What you see here is uh, kilobytes. And then look at the top of the graph, which is an 90th percentile that pretty much does it. So basically, you can say that for most of these applications, uh, we need less than 8 kilobytes. Uh, spec JBB requires about 16 kilobytes. This is still well within the range of what you can put in caches these days. Uh, and then there was, every now and then run to one of those that needed a large amount of state. So in this case, Radix needs about uh, uh, 50 kilobytes, which is relatively large. But it turns out that the right way to go about this is to really think about the way that you generate transactions from the program. So basically, Radix uh, uh, and some other applications, they have a number of loops or a number of nested loops, and you can decide at which level and at what granularity to generate transactions. So you can basically do a trade-off between the size of the transaction uh, and the amount of state it generates. So here you see a few other versions of Radix, which have much lower uh, buffer requirements, uh, 4 to 8 uh, kilobytes. So overall, this basically told us that uh, buffering is not a big issue. Uh, it will happen very, uh, buffer overflows will happen very unfrequently. Any software solution uh, will basically work well enough. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's slow, you won't really go into that uh, uh, that often. Now how about commit bandwidth? What you see here basically is the commit bandwidth necessary to achieve the performance result that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, as we scale the number of processors from 2 to 32, and then we have bytes per cycle in the system. You can assume that you have basically a chip multiprocessor where all the processors connect in a single bus. Basically what you see is that the bandwidth can go all the way up to uh, 17 bytes per cycle, which is non-trivial, but there's a very obvious uh, uh, optimization. Instead of committing whole cache lines, every time you touch one word in the cache line, commit the whole thing, commit only the dirty words in the cache line. And then immediately, uh, the bandwidth drops uh, down to about uh, six or seven uh, bytes per cycle. Uh, so bandwidth is not an issue, at least for this number of processors. Uh, if you scale a lot, it can become an issue again. I'm going to skip this one for the interest of time. Uh, the point of the previous slide is that uh, the arbitration latency is also not a big deal. You can uh, amortize the arbitration latency because you only arbitrate once every transaction as opposed to once uh, on every load and store in a regular cash coherent system. So how do we go to this result? The truth is that the first time that we did transaction in this program, so we didn't get it right. Uh, in the sense that it, it worked correctly, but it didn't give us the best performance. And look a little bit at what can go wrong. And what can go wrong is you can get violations, buffer overflows, you can have a lot of idle time, and then you may not be amortizing the amount of time it takes to generate a transaction. Now, it turns out that basically the hardware that you need to implement uh, transactional coherence correctly pretty much tracks all of them. So you have to be able to detect violations to be able to execute correctly. So why not give this information back to the programmer or to some feedback-driven compiler? So basically, we came up with this approach for doing feedback-driven uh, optimizations. We write the program by basically converting a few loops into transactional loops. Uh, that's the most common case. We run it once. We get basically the feedback where violations were, uh, the overhead, the overflows, and so on. Uh, and for every violation, we, we can basically tell which transaction had the violation with, with which other transaction and on which variable. Then we can basically take this information, go back to the source code, and do one of the following optimizations. If we have high overhead, we merge transactions. If we have violations, the typical case is to do privatization. Uh, we also do sometimes transaction fission, which is not easy. Uh, scheduling, we haven't really done much. Uh, for overflow, transaction fission works fine as well. And sometimes we can get rid of idle time using another transaction. And basically, in most cases, within a few hours, we go from the initial version of this transactional program 
to the best you can get given this hardware and this API, uh, which is typically not the case with uh, conventional parallel programs where you need to understand more about the architecture before you're able to optimize it. So here's a quick example of the kind of improvements we got. Um, on the top graph, basically what you see is the, execute, the speed that we got for each one of these applications as we change the number of processors. The bottom part of the graph, the black one, is what we got initially. For some application like this molecular dynamics code, we got the right thing from the very beginning. We said a few loops are transactional and we're done. For some other application like spec JBB, we got absolutely no speed up the first time around. Then we started looking at the feedback and started implementing a few optimizations like loop adjustment, this is fusion, privatization of variables, and so on. And we started seeing a change in execution time. For example, in the case of the art code, what we basically had was a reduction variable, which was immediately identified by the violation uh, logic. Uh, you basically get uh, a point in the source code and the name of the variable, went back, privatized it, and you got an almost uh, uh, a much better speed up after that. There was a little bit more to get by adjusting the loops to make sure that we had the overhead of small transactions. So basically, over time, what we were able to do is go from a relatively unoptimized version of the application to the best we could get with this model with straightforward feedback. Now, right now, we do all this stuff manually, but there's no reason why a feedback-driven compiler cannot do it for you. Uh, on the bottom graph, what you see is how execution time varies. Uh, <coughs> Uh, for the case of eight CPUs, as we do optimization, basically what we do is we hide violation time, idle time, and waiting time by doing the corresponding optimizations. Okay, so once we got this uh, initial evaluation, uh, we basically you know, got to the conclusion that you know, it's worth pursuing this a little bit further. Uh, so we decided to do basically a more thorough hardware evaluation with a more realistic simulation environment. So we did pretty much the same study, but now we simulate everything in a chip multiprocessor. Caches, contention on the um, uh, interprocessor band with the works. And our goal here was basically to find out the real hardware performance, not the potential, and also compare how uh, the performance of our system with a more conventional CMP implementation, okay? one that does regular cache coherence with a protocol like Messi. Okay? So in this case, we used... Uh, uh, the same applications with a much more detailed uh, uh, execution driver simulator. I'm going to show you results for the SPLAS and the SPECFP program, uh, uh, programs. These results are one week old, uh, and we don't have the results for SPEC JBB yet. Uh, turns out that running JIKES on a simulator is a little bit trickier than running uh, a, a SPECFP program. Oh, well. So this is the kind of system that you're simulating in this case. Uh, it's a chip multiprocessor. Uh, they all have private caches with some extra hooks for the coherence protocol. I'm going to show them in a second. And then they all communicate through a split transaction bus. There is a commit bus, which we use to basically communicate requests to the uh, uh, L2 cache, which is on chip, or do the commits. And there's a refill bus to basically do the refills from the cache back to the processors. So when a transaction commits, it places the data on this bus. They go to the L2 and all the other processors snoop as well to figure out if they need to invalidate or update anything in their cache and if they need to violate because of a dependency. <coughs> so here are the guts of the hardware uh, within every processor. So you need two things to implement transactional coherence. You need some way of tracking state and you need some way of committing state. So in terms of tracking state, you have to worry about two things, the cache and the registers. So you need another version of the register, so you can do a checkpoint at the beginning of a transaction to roll back. Um, this is quite cost effective. There's, there are a lot of papers about how to do this. Uh, it's a trivial overhead in most cases. Now let's look at what happens in the cache. First of all, we get rid of anything that has to do with regular cache coherence. There is no messy state anymore, which sounds nice. There is no messy state. Uh, Instead, we have two sets of bits, the speculatively read bits and the speculatively modified bits. And each bit basically tells you whether the corresponding uh, word in the cache line was read in speculation or written in speculation within this transaction. So you start with these bits being reset, okay, all zero. Every time you do a load, and assuming that the data is in the cache or you fetch them in the cache, you set the SR bit for this corresponding word. Every time you do a store, you set the SM bit for the corresponding word. And we also do a little bit of an optimization. If we read a word for which we have already speculatively written it, there's no need to, to uh, set the speculatively read bit 
This is basically memory renaming. You produce the local value of some variable, which means that you're not really reading the one uh, in the rest of the system. So there's no reason to have dependency violation in this case. So basically, as you read and write data, you set uh, these bits. And this way, you can track uh, all your read and write set at any point in time. Now, this cache can overflow. Okay? Capacity overflows are extremely rare. So anything you do, which basically means uh, in software, it's going to be good enough. Its performance doesn't really matter. What's very common is associativity overflows. Okay? Two things that map to the same cache line uh, uh, are being speculatively read or written uh, within one transaction. And that one can be solved really, really nice by a small victim cache, which is typically there in any process these days anyway. So a 16 entry victim cache essentially eliminated associativity overflows for all our programs. But you could still have a, so could, even the victim cache could Yeah, overflow. and then you can switch to the software. Oh, okay. But with the 16 entry victim cache, it becomes an incredibly rare event, and you know, it just slowed down. So you have to implement the software mechanism also? Yeah. Okay. And anything you do in the software is going to be slow. OK. Uh, but it's not performance critical, and you know, you can do whatever you want. Was there another question? Yeah. Well, it's just a comment about you saying the. Uh, the uh, so far, you've not seen these overflows, and I think that's because of your model of commit points, right? So you, I, 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 I assume that the way your programs are structured, you actually have pretty short transactions. No, the reason that we don't see that is the following: that we basically do this optimization step. Sorry. We do this optimization step. The first version of a program that we write can have terribly huge or terribly small transactions. But we don't just stop there. We go through this optimization step. Now, in a production system, you would like a dynamic compiler to be there and do these optimizations for you, or as many of those as possible. Well, but those optimizations are not something a compiler will be able to do, because putting it, for example, what you did, fission, right? The fission is, 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 is not something a compiler can do. But it's semantic. Well, it you cannot do it. Wait, it cannot do it always, right? Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can prove things about yes, your code. Sometimes not always. Sometimes okay. you You're right. The oh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, uh, so some of the optimization the compiler can do, so some of them it cannot do, and so far we haven't tried to do them automatically. Yes. So. so rather than a comment, maybe I have a question saying, well, how sensitive do you think this, this statement that you have, which is, well, buffer is not a problem, is it to the particular uh, transaction model that you No, it's, it's sensitive to the particular applications. Maybe if we look into something like Apache, this will crash and burn, and it will do something different. But in, even in that case, I will optimize the code after. In the same way that you do GCC-03, I will do the equivalent thing here, whichever it turns out to be. OK, um, so this is how you track state. Then you need some way of committing the state. You basically need to have some way to communicating to the arbiter, which enforces the order. And you need some way of knowing where in the cache you have speculatively modified data. This way, you basically keep a, sto a small FIFO with uh, all the addresses to which we wrote within a transaction. So as you do stores in the data cache, if you have not already speculatively modified this cache line, you push its address into the FIFO. So at the point when you get permission to commit, you read one by one pointers from this FIFO, read the corresponding data from the cache, and flash it out to the rest of the system. Other processors receive those address, snoop into this cache, and see if they need to update, invalid, or even violate. Okay. So overall, the cost that you have here is another copy of the registers, this SR and SM bits, and uh, this, uh, this buffer here. Just to give you a relatively size, if this is a 32 kilobyte uh, uh, cache, uh, this buffer here is about two kilobytes, relatively small. Uh, from the point of view of area, it's, it's, it's quite small. From the point of view of, um, uh, there's also the issue about the control complexity. I'm going to get to that in a second. So buffer overflows, we already talked about this, the victim cache. There is also the issue of double buffering. So if you are worried about the overhead of committing, you can provide double buffering. You're executing the next transaction while committing the current one. Uh, and it turns out that the, com the area over for doing bu double buffering is not large. You need uh, another version uh, of the buffer here, the speculatively read and modified bits, and another register checkpoint. However, the control complexity is large. Uh, that's because you have all this corner case about the way that the two transactions interact, conflicts, violations between them, and so on. So far, we found that our applications don't require double buffering because they don't spend too much time committing anyway. Uh, 
this is one of the things that we may change with, uh, with different applications. So this is good news. Double buffering, which is difficult, we don't need it. So just to step back a little bit, how does this compare to regular cache coherence? Okay, where, um, so we compare to a protocol like Messi, but any other protocol would be pretty much similar. So let's take it one by one. First of all, we have the frequency of coherence events. In a regular protocol, you may have coherence events on every load and store. So every time that you write something new, you need to gain ownership. Or, okay? While in our case, the coherence event is only a commit point. So it's much more infrequent event. And this is good because it also amortizes the latency of, the, uh, of that event. So there's an advantage in our case here. Now, from the point of view of granularity, a regular coherence protocol does cache line tracking while we do word line tracking. Now, you could do word line tracking with a regular coherence protocol. The problem is then that you have way too many events, and that basically may cause bandwidth problems and latency problems. So there's a performance issue that people don't do the cache line tracking. In our case, uh, word line tracking is the right thing to do, and you're going to see in a second how the bandwidth doesn't become an issue. Uh, so there's an advantage for, uh, in, for us here. Uh, for the case of a number of writers, in a regular coherence protocol, there can be only one writer at a time. One CPU has the ownership of a cache line and writes. If somebody else needs to write, grabs the ownership, so you have a single writer at a time. In our case, we can have as many writes as you want. They all write speculatively, and they sort it out at commit time. Synchronization is done with uh, locks and barriers. In the case of regular cache coherence, we do non-blocking uh, synchronization with transactions. Now, let's talk about the, cache, the bandwidth requirements. Regular cache coherence basically requires you to, do, to burn bandwidth whenever you have a regular cache miss or a true communication event. While in our case, we have two things, regular cache misses and commits. So we can burn much more bandwidth. However, this communication here for commit is one very large message sent out to the system. And it can make very good utilization of the bandwidth. While every time that you want to communicate uh, cache lines, you basically need to go through an arbitration cycle for sending something like 64 bytes. So in terms of uh, data exchange, uh, regular cache coherence has an advantage. In terms of utilization of the bandwidth, uh, transactional cache coherence has an advantage. So yeah, question? So you said non-blocking in there. Right. But your algorithm as described is a blocking algorithm. There is a baton that you pass around between the CPUs for commit access. Yeah, so uh, we, one of those CPUs decides to hold on to the baton forever, everybody is blocked. Yeah, but uh, the CPUs grab the baton when they want to commit. So if you have a few gigabytes to commit you, it's essentially forever. <laughs> Otherwise, it's only for as long as you need to flash out your state. But it, say, suppose one, one of your CPUs fails while, while holding the baton. But, oh, no, 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 no. When you fail, so once you grab the, 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 the baton, you're golden. You're the next one to commit. All you can do is cause others to violate. You yourself cannot violate. So you're done. You're golden. No, no, no. Not, not the, the transaction fails. Some, there, there's a short in the CPU. Ah. The hardware fails. OK. And the hardware never gives up the baton. Fine, yes. There is, yeah, there needs to be an, a, a way to. So this is a blocking protocol. <laughs> it's not exactly. So the execution of the code that you want to protect with a lock is non-blocking. The commit happens in this specific implementation I saw you in an ordered manner one by one. So it's somewhere in between. <coughs> For the case of errors, it's a different discussion, uh, uh, basically. This doesn't have to do. The, the, the implementation of commit is a blocking protocol. Right. But the you're right. But the execution of the code associated with the commit you can ex be executed as many of those as you want in parallel. So, yeah, so they don't matter. They do matter. No, we, they don't matter because you have this synchronization point in your commitment. And it's what you already described earlier that there is one guy committing at a time. So you have a point, but here's the point that you're missing. Uh, if all you were doing within a transaction is produce one a word per instruction, one word of in the writer per instruction, you were right. The execution time that you have is pretty much proportional to the commit time. And then being able to execute the commit, the, do the execution in parallel, doesn't mean much. You have an equally sized chunk which has to be ordered. Most programs 
produce a much smaller amount of state than the number of instructions you execute. So you may have a critical region which has 10,000 instructions, which produce 10 words. So you have the 10,000 words you can execute in parallel, and then you serialize the 10 words behind it. Okay. So. Sure, but whatever that speed up factor is, that's all you get. Right. There's a under low bottleneck for the commit, but it's not necessarily the amount of the size of the critical region. It's proportional to the amount of data you produce in the critical region. And if those two are not equal, then you're winning something. So what I'm trying to say is the truth is somewhere in between of what I uh, implied and I was wrong about this and what you're implying. <coughs> We can talk about this further offline. Go on. So here's the result. So basically what you see here is what's happening with applications with all the hardware models now. Uh, as you scale the processors from 2 to 16, uh, the first bar is regular cache coherence. The second one is transactional cache coherence. Uh, and these are the SPLAS applications. So basically what you see here is for the most part, the two behave the same. Okay, there is little, very little difference between the left bar and the right bar in every graph. Okay. For the most part, they are within 10% of one another. Okay. So by going to this transactional cache coherence model, and once again, these are very well-tuned uh, 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 multi-threaded programs running against very well-tuned transactional programs. So not unfairly uh, given an advantage to any one of those. In some cases, transactional cache coherence gets to be a little bit better, and this is typically the case when you have a significant amount of synchronization in your regular cache coherence code. By doing the non blocking synchronization, uh, uh, you win a few things here. But for the most part, they are within 10% of one another. In terms of the bandwidth requirements, I don't have the numbers here, but basically it turns out that the, the, the transactional execution only bears about 10% more bandwidth. Even though we're committing much, much more data, the fact that we don't have to go through arbitration for every single cache line gets us better bandwidth utilization. So these two scale pretty much the same, and the bandwidth which was a big worry for us at the very beginning. It's not a big deal. The thing that we've done from the very beginning is explain a little bit the colors in the graph here. Uh, the blue part is the busy time, the actual code. The red one is misses that go to the L1, L, to the L2 and off chip uh, system and have nothing to do with the parallel execution. Uh, the green portion for the case of regular cache coherence, it is synchronization locks and barriers. For our case, it's basically imbalanced. We don't have enough transactions to run on certain processes every now and then. Uh, the purple color is communication, the commit for the case of transactions, or true or false sharing for the case of, uh, uh, of regular cache coherence. And then you also have the orange part, which is violations for the case <coughs> of uh, of uh, transactions. And it's pretty much non-existent for most cases un until you go to a very high number of processors. These are applications with enough parallelism to begin with. Same numbers for the spec FP applications. The results are pretty much the same. Uh, same performance, more or less. Uh, TCC has an advantage in the cases where the regular cache coherence runs into uh, speculative uh, uh, to uh, high synchronization overhead, uh, while Conventional cache coherence has a small advantage where we're running out of bandwidth or we have some amount of violations. But for the most part, these two behave the same. Going from regular cache coherence to transaction doesn't cause you to drop anything in terms of your performance. So where are we going with this thing? We've been working on this thing for about 12 months now, maybe 13. Uh, we've got big plans, uh, but it will take us a while to get there. The first thing that we want to do is really learn, run some larger scale applications. Uh, from your point of view, all the stuff that I've talked about are probably toy benchmarks. Okay? They're very popular in the architects community, but they don't uh, tell you that much. So for all your questions about the programming model, the buffering, the hardware, and so on, the true way of figuring out if uh, what we have is right or how we need to evolve it is to run big applications. And big applications or snow simulators don't work well. So we try to put together an emulator from Xilinx ports, which have platform FPGAs. Every FPGA has a couple of processors there. Very simple PowerPC process, but good enough for us. Uh, and we can do the transactional memory system with the own chip reconfigurable logic and SRAM. So what we're trying to get basically is an emulator which uh, is at the scale of about 64 to 128 processors. Uh, if you're lucky, like, it's going to run at 100 megahertz. If you're unlucky, it's going to be somewhere around 50. This is much, much faster than any simulator on this size that we can develop. 
These boards are already running Linux, GCC, JIX, and basically what we're doing slowly is inserting transactions into these things. For the most part, we've been doing this with the C API and the Java API. Eventually, we're going to go to the, to the OS. From the hardware point of view, the main question is, how does this thing scale? So for the one chip system, it works fine. For a larger scale system, two things can happen. Either you're spending too much time committing, the Anders law over here that you, uh, uh, that, that you talked about, or we're using too much bandwidth. And there are two things that you can do. You can eliminate bandwidth by basically using uh, directories, get rid of the broadcast. And you can try to do parallel commit. And you can do parallel commit by basically using a two-phase protocol. Okay? Uh, we haven't worked on this, so I'm not really sure how well they will perform, but these are basically uh, the ideas. So you can try to basically as, you know, come up with a protocol that allows you to do parallel commit, and as long as there is parallelism, you're going to be overlapping even the commit time and hopefully eliminate that overhead if it turns out to be the case for larger scale systems. From the point of view of the programming model, we need to basically come up with a clean high-level API for C and Java, something which is more than what uh, our graduate students can play with. Uh, the main question, mark, uh, question marks are, how does it interact with existing language uh, constructs? We probably need to get rid of a few of those. Uh, nesting, which many of you uh, brought up. How does it interact with the recovery features, application level errors, and so on? We haven't really done much there. Uh, we are actively working right now. We're doing some of these optimizations within JIX, at least for Java programs. Uh, and that also brings up some issues with the runtime system. And hopefully when we have this infrastructure here, we'll be able to play with some larger applications. Uh, we've been targeting mostly middleware in our work right now and some big AI apps because uh, it seem to be fairly important for uh, future workloads. And then finally, at some point, you need to go into the operating system. Right now, the operating system for us is one big bottleneck. The moment you hit system call, we basically commit the current transaction, sequentialize the whole system, go to the regular operating system code, and then come back and resume. Uh, this is obviously a bad idea if you have an, an application with a lot of uh, code in the OS. Uh, what we're going to try to do there is basically extend transactions to parts of the OS. You can do a two-phase uh, handle of I.O. and OS requests. You do all the protocol processing uh, in a transactional mode, and you do the last write later on. It doesn't work with everything, but it will work with a few things. And I think it will interact really well with cer certain transactional features in the I.O. or the OS system, like uh, log-based file system. Now, we're obviously not there yet for all this stuff, but we hope to get there. So this is basically uh, the whole idea. We try to use transactions all the time. And the idea is to use a single, a single abstraction for parallelism, synchronization, atomicity, and everything. So far, the results are good. There's still a lot of uh, uh, work. And our hope is that at the end of the game, we're going to be able to tell that parallel program transactions is much more practical than anything else that we have right now for the average developer. Before I finish, I'll just point out that there's a whole army of students behind this project. And all the results, basically, are because of their hard work. All I do, basically, is complain about the numbers they get, and they go back and regenerate them. And there is a web page which is a little bit more information about all this stuff, plus a couple of papers that we have already published on the topic. Question there? Any questions? I think you're probably worried. <laughs> do you have any results? Uh, regarding the frequency of uh, rollbacks due to data dependency? We do have them. For the apps that we've looked so far, are highly parallel. So they're very uncommon in the optimized version of the code. <coughs> but we do have the, if you look at, uh, well, if you look at the papers, basically, we tell you how as we optimize the program, we get to reduce the violation count. And it's typically because of things like privatized variables and so on. So you start with a sequential program, you need to privatize a few variables, and you find out the hard way and go back and fix them. Because I remember from, from a course that I've taken uh, on um, computer architecture. It's actually in the book by Hennessy and Patterson. And it says that like <coughs> almost all benchmark programs, the frequency of uh, conditional jumps, conditional branching, it's like 16% uh, of the instructions are conditional branch. Right, but this is a problem that we mostly have within the transactions as opposed to... So this means that data dependency uh, depends appear very frequently. So data dependencies within a transaction and branches within a transaction are as much of a problem as they used to be. Okay. Now, across transactions, 
it comes back to your program. If it doesn't have parallelism or if it has fine group communication patterns, this will not work and nothing yeah, else will work. Yeah. So it depends okay. on the program itself. So all, all this is about parallelism. The assumption is that there is parallelism out there. Mm -hmm. Just notice it okay. on top. Okay. If there's no parallelism, we're wasting our time. Yes. Really. <laughs> Well, I think we probably should uh, wrap yeah, it up. Well, thank the speaker.